So we're going to talk about the work necessary to develop the reservoir model within RMC RFA, uh, which is represented using a stage storage discharge relationship. So this presentation is going to focus on the reservoir routing model, and we'll talk about the basics of level pool routing, uh, reservoir operations, the water comb control plan, how to extend your storage curves, and developing or extending discharge rating curves for your model. Now, the reservoir routing model is important because it helps us to determine what the peak stage is going to be in RMC RFA and informs our ultimately our stage frequency curve or hydrologic loading curve. So typically for these types of reservoir routing operations, we assume level pool routing. So pool is level, inflow minus outflow equals change in storage. Uh, there are cases where you have really large or large and long reservoirs that level pool routing might not be an appropriate assumption. And every once in a while you can't use this, but this is generally pretty good approach. So to develop a reservoir model, uh, most water control manuals, especially for core projects or Bureau of Reclamation projects, uh, include plates and fingers that specify how discharges can be released from the structure. And so that's always the first place to check. Uh, these documents, like in the water control manual, often have elevation versus area, elevation versus storage curves, which define the physical geometry of the reservoir summarized in one curve. And so these are important because this actually tells you for a given change in elevation in your reservoir, you know, how much does storage change? Uh, and when we're actually doing the reservoir routing computation, and we're looking at how much inflow is coming in, how much storage that adds to the reservoir, and then we're getting back out what the elevation should be. So when you're developing your stage storage curve, um, a lot of the times, very commonly, what you'll run into is you'll have the curve covering a fair degree of your site, but for the types of analysis that we do where we're looking at the PMF or sometimes you know 1.5 times the PMF, you need to go beyond that. And simple extrapolation methods usually aren't the best at extending your elevation storage curves up higher up. Uh, so fortunately, uh, HEC RAS is actually really easy to do, and that's kind of what this is showing here using this storage area. But if you have any questions about this, there's actually some tutorials on HEC's website on how to do it. But in RAS, you can even download a train automatically. Just draw your storage area boundary based on a contour or going past what you think the extents of flooding are. And you can compute this directly from the train data set. And then you can compare that to your existing stage storage relationship. And you can kind of figure out what that additional extended region should be, which is shown in blue on this plot here. Uh, just be aware that if you're using that type of technique to extrapolate your curve in RAS, be careful with your boundary because if RAS hits that boundary, it'll just start extending it straight up uh, and not out. So that's why you usually want to go fairways past and truncate your results. So many flood control dams are operated with consideration of downstream flood constraints. Uh, so you might have rate of release constraints, uh, could be operated in conjunction with other dams and system operation, which further complicates releases from the structure. Um, also, how the project operates is based on its design, such as gated or ungated spillway. So be sure to check the water control manual. Uh, typically, Chapter 7 outlines the water control plan in core reservoirs. Uh, to find out how the dam is operated and works during large events, also check for emergency operations curve, operations curves that define what to do once you get above the top of dam. Do they just let the flow go by opening all gates? Um, that sort of thing. So a lot of low flow and sluice gates are closed for pools above the top of the flood control, but it's dependent on the project. So make sure to know how the dam will operate for not only conditions that have been seen, but for hypothetical events, such as like a large PMF. So, you know, how do they spell out what they want the dam to do under certain scenarios? You should be cognizant of that when you're developing the elevation stage discharge relationships. So this is an example of a spillway discharge rating curve for it looks like Smithville Lake. So this is always what you want to start with. Um, these were the calculations that were used to define the discharge capacity of the spillway when it went into operation. And 
Sometimes these will extend high enough up for the purposes of your study, but if they don't, you may also need to extend them, and we'll talk a little bit about the best way to do that. So this is a basic diagram showing a dam with an ungated spillway. Um, and so, you know, like a OG weir spillway, for example. There are various pools the dam is operated with, and these vary from project to project. And so for most dams with ungated or uncontrolled spillways, the only method of control is the low flow outlet works and or hydropower. Uh, this is a basic diagram showing a dam with a gated spillway, such as a tanner gate. Um, there are various pools the dam is operated within, and these also vary from project to project. Uh, when you're trying to come up with these stage discharge relationships, you also have to be cognizant of what kind of flow regimes you would expect at the site. The four commonly ones, the four common ones that we see are free uncontrolled, submerged uncontrolled, or free controlled flow, and submerged controlled flow. And so you can see that free uncontrolled flow means that you know we're in full weir flow. Uh, the water is not touching the bottom lip of the gate, and the tailwater impacts actually aren't causing any adver any backup effects or tailwater influences on the flow going over the the spillway portion of the dam. Submerged so uncontrolled flow, uh, you'll see this when the tailwater is high enough that the top lip of the gate where the flow is entering the structure uh, is still free weir flow, but you're losing discharge capacity because tail water is basically getting in the way. And then free controlled flow, the water has gotten above the top of the lip of the gate, but there's still no tail water impacts. And then for the submerged controlled flow scenario, we're up above the top of the gate, so we're in full orifice flow, but then we also have tail water impacts that are further restricting our flow. So it's, it's good to understand what kind of flow conditions your structure might encounter so that you can do the hydraulic computations correctly to extend your curves. And so each of these are just close-ups of what we just discussed. So discharge estimates for free uncontrolled flow can be approximated using the Weir equation. I'm sure everybody's seen this from the first water resources class that you ever took. So it depends whether you're working in metric or SI units, uh, but the Q has units of feet squared per second, and the net effect of spillway length L has units of feet, and the energy head has units of feet. Uh, the discharge fun coefficient C is a function of the gravitational constant, and therefore it's not dimensionless, and it value, its value depends on what unit system you're working, because the discharge coefficient is determined empirically, because we can measure flow, we can measure length, we can measure head, but measuring energy loss through a structure is a lot harder to do. So that's what that discharge coefficient helps us accomplish. So when you're calculating the discharge capacity of your spillway, um, if you have piers, like say you have you know six or seven tainer gate bays, each is separated by a pier, obviously water shouldn't be going through that space. So you need to count, you need to account for not only the space taken up by those piers, but also the fact that you're actually losing some capacity by having those obstructions and energy losses there too. And so that's what this net effective length calculation helps you to do, is figure out overall, like what is the actual length that we should use in our spillway uh, estimate for flow. The abutment and pier coefficients can be found in engineer manual 1110-2-1603, uh, hydraulic design charts. Um, this is the abutment contraction coefficient for an earthen embankment uh, and a concrete abutment. And here is the pier contraction coefficient for various pier-shaped noses. Uh, you take these coefficients and you plug them back into that effective length calculation on the previous slide. So this one. Uh, these coefficients covered are for high head spillways, uh, where the design head is much greater than the height of the spillway structure. Other charts and coefficients should be used for other types of spillways. You know, the Bureau of Reclamation's classic design of small dams has a lot of great hydraulic computation guidance in it. And then a lot of older core guidance, you know, what's now known as the Coastal Hydraulics Laboratory, uh, waterway experiment station charts or WEST charts actually have a lot of the hydraulic design charts used for some of the spillways that we see. So. So this is the design chart for a spillway crest discharge coefficient for a high overflow dam. Uh, the coefficient of discharge C varies with head and depends on the ratio of the design head and the energy head of the desired pool. So now we can calculate the free flow spillway curve 
based off of the Weir equation. But next, we'll look at discharge for free control gate flows. So that is important to know because I ran into a project like this where um, the original author had extended the Weir flow equation using a constant head. But looking into the water control manual, they actually did reference the hydraulic design charts. And that coefficient of discharge does change as the pool is increasing. So that has to be accounted for to get a correct estimate of flow. Especially because, you know, what we're interested in are those rare exceedance events. We're really wanting a lot of flow through there. So discharge estimates for free controlled flow can be calculated using equation one here, which is based on equation 6-1 in EM 1110-2-1603. The discharge coefficient has units of feet, cubic feet per second. Uh, the discharge coefficient, uh, the net gate coping coefficient, or G naught, has units of feet, and the gate width B has units of feet. So the gate width B uh, is this gate opening here, and it's not measured straight up and down vertically. It's actually the overall distance between the bottom lip of the gate and the top of the dam or the structure there. And then the gate opening, this is measured vertically up and down, but it's from the top or the pool elevation down towards the middle of the gate. So not the spillway crest here, but to the actual middle of the gate opening. So, you know, there are all there are equations that you can figure out and you can also do trigonometry. <laughs> to figure out what that value should be. So good eighth grade math there for you. And then you can use that fancy hydraulic design equation to estimate the flow through the structure. <laughs> so now that we have a little understanding of what these equations are and how they are useful for spill, calculating the spillway rating curve, um, we can look to validate and extend the spillway rating curve to over the top of the dam or to the elevation needed to define our hydrologic hazard curve. So it's promoted to investigate the design document and the water control manual to try and determine the equations and coefficients used for design. And the best method for extending a rating curve is to validate to the existing rating curve and then use the equations to extend to the desired elevation. So you should be validating using what they have in the water control manual, seeing if you get a match or any discrepancies. If you get any discrepancies, evaluate why. Um, and this also just helps inform our confidence that once we're extrapolating beyond what's published in the water control manual, we feel good about it. Uh, the discharge and the flow regime depend on three things. So that's the pool elevation, the gate opening, and the nap profile of the spillway. So if the nap intercepts the gate, uh, it'll generally be controlled flow. But if the nap passes under the gate, it will generally be free flow. So that's just like the, the essentially the lowest point of your gate, so like the lip of a tainer gate, for example. Um, here's some examples for taking published rating curves and validating them and then extending them with the equations and coefficients that we discussed in the previous slides. Uh, the first spillway was an uncontrolled spillway, so the Weir equation was used for extension. And you can, it's tough to see here, but it looks like it ended right here. And then we extended further on past here. And the second is a gated spillway with validated flows for gate operations, as well as the max capacity, which is free flow. Uh, so when the gate is open and not submerged, we follow this curve, but then we have different considerations for different gate openings, flows, and headwater elevations which are what all these offshoot curves are. And this third plot shows the previous validated free flow curve, but now includes the transition orifice flow above the top of flood control. So what you encounter here is, if you have a really large flood event coming through, your gates are out of the water, passing flow and passing flow and passing flow using weir flow, which is H to the three halves power, so it's very efficient. But gates can only open so far, and eventually you get enough inflow that the bottom of that lip gets submerged. And what happens? You transition from weir flow to orifice flow. So, you know, that's like going from your head on the dam to the three halves power down to the one half power. And so that's why you get this change in slope here and a reduced discharge capacity. And so this is something that's really important to look for because sometimes people extrapolate out. They just say weir flow all the way, and that's not the case if you have something like tainer gates, for example. You need to account for that because this reduced discharge capacity can really impact some of your uh, loading curve results at the upper end. Then many gated projects have family of curves similar to this. 
uh, which is titled here as the emergency operation schedule, or is also called the emergency spillway release diagram, commonly abbreviated as ESRD. Uh, the x-axis of required outflow is determined based on the reservoir elevation on the y-axis and the reservoir rate of rise and inflow over a given time period on the various curves. So the induced surcharge envelope curve is shown in red and it's the minimum release required for reservoir elevations about the top of active storage or the top of flood control, even if the pool is not rising at a rapid pace to require larger releases. Uh, it's often a good place to start when assuming spillway releases for a range of loadings and for a risk assessment or RFA model. And does everybody here know what induced surcharge is? Yeah, so essentially it's your gates loaded and you know, you're know you storing above your top of active storage or top of active flood control because you're letting water up against the gate. And so some operations that's built in and that's where these curves really come into play. Is because like these are your up above your top of dam and you're allowing it to do that by controlling with the gate to try and gain additional storage while sometimes making releases. So it's important that the stage storage discharge function uh, be extended beyond the top of the dam to include overtopping discharge information. Uh, we need to extend this function as far as necessary to define the full hazard curve that's needed for the risk analysis. In a lot of cases, just going a few feet above the top of the dam is all that's necessary, uh, but it could vary, you know, depending on what your site is and what, what your system is. Okay, um, for this dam, they experienced significant settling of the crest from the design. And you can see that if we use the design crest, which is given in that black line there, compared to the surveyed crest, uh, we wouldn't be getting an accurate discharge estimate of what's going over the dam. And so there are cases where you could discretize this and use the weir flow equation to get a better estimate, depending on the level of study. Or there are also cases where you probably want to run something like this through a RAS model to actually get a good estimate of what your extended stage discharge rating curve would be. Yeah, and this is just that same note there. Uh, a lot of times, useful information in the water control manuals was probably done and published and written into those manuals between 1920 and 1950. And it's really useful to digitize that information. And so there are actually a lot of free tools in the webs and some software programs that let you do that. But uh, this is just an example of one tool that can be commonly used. It's really great because you can just save uh, an image from the water control manual, upload it, add these points in red here, uh, tell it what your axes are, and it'll actually spit out that curve for you. So it's an awesome place to start. You can use it to get some of these spillway discharge rating curves, or like I've used it before to get like uh, an IDF or a PMF event that I did not have time series information for, so that I could run it through one of my models to see what the peak discharge would be and what the peak flow elevation would be. So it's just useful to call this out, but you don't have to use that one. There are a lot of different programs, but it's a really good tool. It can save a lot of time and it can get you some really useful information about how your PMF changes or how the models you're using get a different result or the same result. So we talked about level pool routing. Uh, we talked about how to extend your elevation storage curves. We talked about how to extend your stage discharge curves. Uh, and we also talked about useful tools for getting information out of your walk control manual.